All right, we made it. Good. We made it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our panel, Sustainability in the Esports Landscape. Quick introductions. My name is Joshua Gray, creative producer for Turtle Entertainment America. Our flagship product is ESL, short for the Electronic Sports League, which is the world's largest esports company and the leader in various offline and online competitions in multiple games. To my immediate right, we have Kevin Lin, hello, from Twitch TV who we've worked many times at many different events. We see each, other, see each other all the time. Instrumental in the 2011 launch when he joined Justin TV in 2008. His role included attracting the site's largest broadcasters and building out the partnerships team, among other endeavors, which have helped grow the Twitch brand. Great to have you here, Kevin. Thank you, Josh. Chris Sigety is a 19-year Blizzard Entertainment veteran and is currently the executive producer of StarCraft II, Heroes of the Storm, and Blizzard Esports. Great to have you here, Chris. Thanks very much, Josh. And finally, we have Mohamed Fadl, the War Gaming Director of Esports in Europe and North America. We call him Mo for short. He has spearheaded the initiatives for esports for War Gaming. Mo, always a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> to give you guys a, a quick breakdown of what this topic is really about, we have to look at the past and how radio and television worked as sustainable methods of delivering sports content. Now, in 19... 20. September 6th was the first radio broadcast for a prize fight. In 1921, RCA, the makers of radios, broadcasted the World Series. The head of RCA at the time, David Sarnoff, said that baseball is vital for radios. And once we put radios inside America's homes, they will listen to our news, they will listen to our dramas, and they will listen to our comedies. Sports went hand in hand in media technology that continued in the television. October 22nd, 1939, the NFL features their first game broadcasted on TV. In 1955, we have color, and that was a very big deal. 1965, graphics are added to sports broadcasts to help tell the story of what's happening on the field. 1976, cable TV comes around because Ted Turner wanted to watch the Atlanta Braves when he was on his yacht in New York. So thank you, Ted Turner, for that. 1979, ESPN is launched. 1994, satellite television with the NFL Sunday ticket, allowing anybody with that service to watch whatever game they want on Sunday. It didn't matter where they lived, according to broadcast television. 1998, the first 10-yard line that we now see was broadcasted over television for the first time. People started recording sports on DVRs in 1999, 2003, the year of HD, 2005, internet broadcasting of traditional sports. Biggest event that happened for sports when it came to television was last weekend for the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl was streamed online with 800,000 concurrent viewers and a peak of 1.3 million. All of us in this panel can agree that eSports has not only reached those similar numbers for the Super Bowl and internet broadcasting, they have surpassed those numbers. eSports, video game competition is here to stay. How do we make it sustainable? That's what we're talking about. The first topic, though, is going to be an introduction of what esports means to each of these companies and these representatives and their development approach. Chris, let's start with you. All right, thanks, Josh. So at Blizzard, we view esports as a community builder. That's the, the bottom line of that. And we arrived at that not through uh, statistical analysis or some sort of deep dive into um, big business or anything like that. It was arrived at with the advent of, of StarCraft and the growth that the community built up around the game, and our appreciation and love for being a part of that. We are the community. Um, so as, as eSports built up, community built around StarCraft, we realized that this is awesome. We loved it. We love participating in it. And now can look at ways as we bring out more games and, and continue to release products, how, how can we have that with the games where it's appropriate? Now, Mo, for World of Tanks, which is another eSports title, what is your approach? What is Wargaming's approach to making this an eSport? Uh, for us, it was a bit different as we were never meant to be an eSports game in the first place when we launched. Uh, it happened some on the basic start was a very community-driven as well uh, approach that, hey, we want to have some competition, we want to have some eSports activities. And um, Victor Kisley, our CEO, is a very open-minded person with the community and he said, oh, yeah, good idea, let's do it. So we said, okay, we do eSports, it can't be that hard, come on, it's... We started then... You were there in the beginning, 2012, and uh, we could see it was a very massive big pickup within the community, which had like a very strong need to challenge each other, to, hey, we want to see, we want to participate, we want to engage. And we said, okay, maybe there's a big, even more behind it. 
then we started the first time really looking at numbers. Who's really engaging? Who are we targeting with our esports activities? And then we could see that a very good example is one of our first tournaments, a very small scale in Europe, I remember it. It was like 600 attendees. We said, oh, it's quite cute, okay, this is esports, we made it. Very grassroots, very basics. And then within less than a year, tournaments grew from 600 attendees up to 28,000 participants. In single tournaments, we have several ones per day. So we could say, wow, okay, there's a very, very strong engagement in our core, core community, the big spenders, the guys who are like the, the high tier end content seeker, they are participating heavily in our grassroots tournaments. Then we said, okay, with this approach, we need to build something bigger. We need to build an ecosystem where it fits in for the, for the business, for the company. Then we get to this beautiful approach, which a lot of other companies have as well, the league approach. And then we could see, okay, if we make a big investment for, let's say, the gold league, investing 10 million, let's say, like this, or a bit even more, the first year, to build the top league, to create content for the rest of the consumers, and we could see the change of behavior in our audience when we had a big event like the grand final, we had over 12,500 viewers coming on site to watch the event happening, and live over 7.5 million streamers following this event. Over three days, we were quite impressed, and then we could see the behavior changed of the people, meaning spending, what kind of tanks they use, what, how they play, they were influenced by these super teams. How they play, we could see the heat maps, suddenly their behavior changed. Um, the tanks, which they tried to reach, changed as well. Then suddenly they went another tier track. Hey, I want this one because Navi is playing this one. So we could see it has a very strong impact in our core audience. And then we said, okay, what is esports for us as wargaming? We started as a community-driven event. And especially now, 2014 was a very, very hard year for us especially understanding what we are. We're having Blizzard, Riot, Revolve outside. They have amazing esports happening, and we're just there like, mm, okay, we have to make our game an esports game. And this was quite an interesting challenge. And it was quite a journey as well to see that growth for, for World of Tanks, and now actually to go to Eastern Europe and see how huge it is. And the American audience is continuing to build and build. But the only reason we can have an audience is for a platform to deliver what we're seeing, and that's with Twitch. And Twitch has been incredibly, incredibly in instrumental in the growth of esports. But how has Twitch approached this new phenomenon? Thanks, Josh. Yeah, for us, I mean, esports um, was really a catalyst for us starting Twitch in the first place. Uh, we had built this big platform, this live video platform called Justin TV, a uh, very generalist platform um, for global distribution of content. It was really riding that wave, you know, with YouTube um, as as media shifted to to online digital. Um, but for us. You know, we had gotten the company to a pretty safe place, but we wanted more internally. Um, and Emmett and Jacob and a couple of the other guys at the company really dug in and, and thought, what can, where can we take this product? And uh, StarCraft II Beta had actually just come out, and we were playing uh, from about 8 p.m. till midnight every single night. And we'd go home and we'd watch YouTube videos of Husky StarCraft and HD and all these guys that were creating great professional commentary videos trying to improve our game. And we started scratching our heads, like, why don't people do this live? Why don't people do this on, on our platform? Uh, and it was really that, that, that outreach and sort of getting, um, getting feedback from that community and understanding what it is they needed from a platform like ours that's live video instead of VOD, that's inherently social via chat and other social mechanisms, and how can we expand on that product. Um, and it changed the way we thought about the company a lot. We had to, we, we did start building our own server infrastructure very early on, but we focused a lot on you know, North, the North American audience. Um, esports being inherently global, we had to expand quickly into the European audience, and you know this year we're going to have to expand even even further into other regions. Um, but server infrastructure, software, all was very different from a sort of general live streaming platform. People expect HD quality video; they want to watch a game as if they're playing that game, and it has to be low latency. You can't drop frames, and that technology was really not available yet. So we were really having to kind of pioneer how that content was going to get delivered, um, and then building that social experience around that. And then also um, a big part, a big change for us was um, revenue models for broadcasters. How can we support the esports ecosystem from the ground up, starting with players and teams to tournament organizers to game companies? What do we need to build for people to understand what it means to be successful as an esports content creator? How can you earn a living um, as a content creator, as a, as a player, so that you can play um, and practice appropriately to play at a very high level rather than having to work a job, 
practice at night, um, and then go to a competition. So I think we wanted to build that ecosystem, uh, completely changed the way we thought about our business and growing that, um, and, and thus Twitch was born. So who has the power to declare a game is an eSport? Is that Twitch? Is that the developer? Is it the players? Is it the audience? Is it an amalgamation of everybody at once? Who makes a distinction that this game is eSports worthy? We, well, I was going to just jump in and say, at least at Blizzard, we believe that the community absolutely determines that. And we take a careful approach with our games as we go in. We may have an idea that we think it will be a, a, a very fun game to watch competitively and turn into an eSport, but we make no assumptions about that. And that's been the way we've approached. We have now three major games, four really, games that we're dealing with, and they're all dealt with in different ways, subtly different ways, but the league structure, the way we go into it. But every time when we're kicking the game off, we, one, have to know we have a competitive game. It's fun. We're going to be in it you know, for the long haul with keeping the balance there, um, continuing to support it, and then watch and, and embrace what the, the community is doing. Um, and, that, and that's sort of our stance in general. We, we want to be beside and in that community uh, watching that happen. If, if you declare it, I think uh, you, you potentially set yourselves up for failure with that if you just say, we are an eSport and we're going to do this. You, it's a process. It's a process. It's not an event. It's a process. Right. And that leads into major events, though. Uh, Mo, with, with World of Tanks, 15 on 15 is the standard way to play. We shifted it to 7 versus 7 into the team battles. That's part of the shift that you mentioned yes. of, of making it into an eSport game, more eSport friendly. What was that process like? What made, what made you make those decisions to have 7-on-7 seven seven compared to 15-on-15? 15 15? Uh, just to go back completely, because we had no idea what we are doing. I'm very honest, OK? eSports was out there. We said, OK, we do it as well. We have 15 versus 15. Let's do 10 versus 10. Let's do 5 versus 5, because it's very popular, 5 versus 5, 3 versus 3. And then we could see. Uh, we had big teams already, and there has a very strong community already. And we said, we, can't, we don't want to split them up. We don't want to start in the beginning and say, hey, guys, sorry. I know you're a cool team. You're together since the beginning World of Tanks, but sorry, you don't fit our business model. So we started to say, OK, let's start with 7 versus 7 with uh, up to two extra players they can have in a team with a very strange point system. Let's be very honest, we had no real clue. We said, OK, we do eSports. Yeah, we do it. Then we could see our games were um, a bit challenging, not only for the teams, as well for the consumers of players, viewers at home. Uh, we saw games would have like 12 draws, meaning there was no ending. The, for three, four hours, people had to watch the game. You know, it happened in Russia, a very big thing. And we could see, okay, there must be a domestic, we need to make changes. No matter what, we have to change what's happening. So we were going back to step one. It was quite a hard step after a year of investing and doing. And uh, we sit down with all global pro teams, 12 in each region, and said, hey, guys, we need your help. Let's be very honest, because in the end, the community drove us there. And now we need to ask the players, how can we make it happen? Give us your insight. Because we started, thought, OK, this is eSports. And we realized, OK, maybe it wasn't the right approach. So we went back and sit down for six months very heavy testing with a lot of teams globally, flew them in, tested different mods, approaches, to come up then after a lot of tears with a complete new rule set, which is active now since two months. And which, very successful. Yeah. Very successful compared to the 7x42 that we had. This is the craziest thing, because we're like, OK, let's really go in the end with the, what the pro teams really recommended. Let's do it like this. We improved the UI. And this is something for eSports. I think these days there are some basic expectation, basic rules you have to, to fit, you have to have. Meaning it must have UI, which is very easy, accessible for the viewer at home. If you have too many details, too many depth, people won't understand. Very good example, my wife at home, I showed her the stream, and she said, I understand these are tanks. I got the connection, but what's happening? Why does it go there? Why do so we're OK, it's a very good exercise to have someone like this with you who has no clue what you want to show them, because if we use a platform like Twitch, we have such a massive audience who has no real idea about our game. And they see suddenly this high quality esports tournament running with big names they know, big commentators, superstars. Then it's crucial that we as a company make it as easy, accessible for the viewer and entertaining, very important. So they step the first they step into our universe. And this is something beautiful we do with esports with Twitch as well, because our entertainment changed with, from having a passive just consumption as TV into a being very active, 
means our customers, our players, our viewers, our, they are part of more now. They join in on Twitch, they chat with us, they chat with the superstars, they vote, they cheer for their teams, they're coming to big events, and this is for a company. Very interesting to see this very strong engagement beyond what we ever had before, because we are now in their living room, not only on their PC when they play with our game. In their free time, they watch Twitch, they watch the games, they watch Blizzard, Riot, us, bring some content, and they consume it in a completely different level. And this was a very big thing for us to understand what is esports, yeah. how do we have to do it? How do you have to change it? And, and how to make it work. How to make yes. it work for the audience, how to make it work for the players, and how to make it work for the leagues in order to create something that is sustainable yes. and has tournament integrity. And it's great to see developers continually understanding, okay, when you make shifts here and changes there, because the same thing happens in traditional sports. Every year they'll announce a slight tweak here to this rule, or you can only have three timeouts instead of four, stuff like that. But it makes a difference in the development of those leagues. And this leads into topic number two of the business impact of investing in esports. And you kind of painted a really good picture of seeing the impact of creating something and then seeing all these people start to show up. Yeah. You, took, you look at an amount and you go, well, we can make it a fantastic trailer, beautiful trailer that'll live on YouTube, maybe we get a, a million hits for this cost, or we can make a league and have it be sustainable and increase the, the traffic for our game in <laughs> such large ways that a lot of people were not really pre prepared for back in 2010, 2011. I think, Chris, you can chime in a little bit here too with looking what Korea did and then what America did with StarCraft II when it was released and how that investment for your team shifted a bit. Yeah, of, so as far as investment goes, we, we, there's, there's a lot of commitment if you're gonna make an eSport. And, and again, I admit and say that we didn't create an eSport, the community created an eSport out of the games we put together. Um, but the commitment goes from the developers that are gonna be carefully looking at balance uh, the, the different features that you have to add to the game to ensure that you can view it and watch it in a pleasant way and that you continue to evolve that. A commitment to knowing that you're going to need to make change often. We're still, it, it's not slight tweaks these days, it's still significant change, I think, uh, evolutionarily, uh, year on year. We're, we're making big choice change that you don't see happen really uh, in, in professional sports the same way. Um, yeah, they're, not gonna, they're not going to change the ball. They're not right. going to change the shape of the ball. Right, they're right. not going to change how many players on the field most of the time. Right. Um, policies within how you want to approach it for your, your company, for your game. Um, there's the cost. There, we have a really passionate esports team of people that work with all the different partners and, and the community and teams and, and players. Um, so there's, that, there's all of these costs. And then what is the return is the thing that I think, you know, for DICE, for people here, what, what do we after out of that, and for us at Blizzard, that return, I, I feel like, ends up being um, the longevity of the game. It's a critical part of why even StarCraft, original StarCraft Brood War, is still played and is still relevant and is still being purchased um, today, and eSport is a huge part of that reason. Um, but if you sat down and today look statistically at, at what money is coming back in as a result day on day, um, I don't think it necessarily adds up, but it totally adds up when you just talk about the celebration of this game, the, the community you have, um, and, and even our, uh, our passion to, to continue to see it happening and, and um, watch events, et cetera. And that passion reciprocates when people fire up their own streams to talk about the tournament or create gaming talk shows or journalistic shows to talk about what's happened at these major events and who won, and Twitch, again, instrumental in that. But why is it, Kevin, that, that Twitch is the platform leader for esports programming? Why is it that Twitch is doing so well? Why is it that Amazon just acquired Twitch for nearly a billion dollars? Sure, I mean, for us, it was, it was all about focus, right? We, we wanted to build something around gaming and gaming culture, uh, and specifically around esports as well. And it took that focus, and it meant we were building specific products that serve this community and serve the game companies. And it takes that level of commitment to do that. Um, and it was a big risk for us originally, right? I mean, we didn't know how big it was gonna grow, but we knew that it was something we personally wanted to see happen in the world. We, we wanted that culture to grow, um, so we continue to invest and do that. I think you know, it, it's, it's about, like I said earlier, building that entire ecosystem, supporting it from the ground up. I think one of the big things where, for us, you know, we, we certainly understand the, the investment. We, you know, we invest in server infrastructure around the world, we get viewership. Each time we build out, typically, we do a lot of research on the region, we make sure there's growth there, we make sure there's you know, good opportunity there, uh, and then we go in and invest. But I think the big thing that we need to start thinking about this year a little bit more 
in depth is communicating that value back to the game developers. How, do, how does a game developer really understand, OK, this event happened, or there's all these streamers, individual streamers of my game. What's the actual impact on my game? And you, you start to see these graphs. There's this great um, counterfeit graph uh, that was published um, that revealed every time there was a major event, a dream hack or an ESL, there was a 40 to 70% spike in concurrent player base in the game. And then after a couple of days, it settled at you know, 25, 30% higher. So they certainly see that impact, but it's not a direct measurement just yet. Can there be that direct measurement? Can you actually open up as game companies to build a deeper relationship with streamers in a scalable way that potentially opens up additional revenue streams for them or otherwise gets them so much more engaged in the game that they're actually driving their viewers back in to play with them or play with each other? Um, and I think that level of investment is where we hope to strive to you know, help other folks understand. And everybody took a risk 95 years ago when they were doing radio broadcasts for the same time. And then once radios were in every household, television came out. And some of the more established folks go, why do I need a, a television? I have a radio already. Technology keeps pushing things forward. Twitch has been very instrumental in that. But now, in gaming, we have two technologies. Well, maybe three. Mobile, consoles, and PC. Is the esports audience divided based on the actual hardware platform they're watching on, or is it more based on games? Um, it is somewhat divided. I mean, I think m mobile esports is very nascent right now, and I think actually um, that there's a huge growth potential there. In fact, we were talking to Christian last night um, from Vainglory, and he was telling us that although their game isn't perfect for an esport in, in terms of what Mo was mentioning earlier, there's not really a, a spectator mode, so there's not high spectatability viewability in the game but entire communities are figuring out ways to essentially hack the game, so to speak, so that they can create an eSport playing in their own game mode, which is fascinating to see. Like, you really can't predict as a game company whether or not a game's going to become an eSport. And you look at traditional, you know, traditional sports games like FIFA, like Madden, don't really have a big eSports presence, and it's not because those games aren't big, and they're certainly understood in terms of the rule set governing the game and how competitions can be played, but the communities just haven't really embraced that yet. In terms of whether how that divides up, I mean, right now we don't, you know, we do see you know, high focus on, on the game specifically. We used to see a lot more, um, if you were watching on an Xbox, you were watching typically more Xbox titles. Um, but these days, as we've expanded our ubiquity in, um, um, in terms of access of where you can watch Twitch, consoles, mobile, tablets, web, um, that starts to blend a little bit. So continue on to 2014, what happened last year. Very big year for eSports, there's a number of graphs people can check out on, on Google to find out the actual metrics of a number of games. But this year, where does this stand right now for Twitch? After 2014, looking at all the analytics, where do you stand as a company right now with eSports? Yeah, I mean, eSports is still growing very rapidly. The, the overall audience base for Twitch has basically doubled over the last, every, every year over the last four years. We just crossed 100 million uniques per month. Um, Esports, in my opinion, I think is just scratching the surface. I think you're going to see this whole new generation of game developers trying to build a game for esports. Of course, you know, heed, heed these warnings we're, we're giving you now. It's not so simple. Even if you build all the right things into it, you still have to, you know, have that touch point with the community. You have to have a community that wants it, um, and you have to listen to them and adapt the game and you know change, you know, change the balance, change the meta uh, as needed to, to develop that. For us, though, we continue to invest in esports just as we always have. You know, early, early on, um, as we were building out Twitch, before Twitch became really Twitch, um, we invested a lot in, in community tournaments and in, in teams um, to help build that, that core foundation of the ecosystem. And we, we plan to continue doing that as new communities emerge. Um, so we'll continue to stay an important, very important part of what we do at Twitch. Uh, we'll continue to invest and support in any way that we can. 2014, very big year for Blizzard as huge, well. Huge, huge year. Um, this BlizzCon was our biggest yet. It was almost too much in some ways. We <laughs> had so much going on, and, and that is one of the, the challenges that we, we face. I think it also is faced by the industry in general um, of what is, what is too much. How do, how do we unify this in some way? Um, we're, we're figuring that out for just the Blizzard titles alone. So BlizzCon this year, amazing uh, turnout for Hearthstone, for StarCraft II. Um, we're certainly investing a lot, new stages, all of this, a lot of excitement around it, World of Warcraft, Heroes Invitational. Um, just working it into the schedule of BlizzCon was challenging. And even as a, just being a little, uh, as a fan myself and, and wanting to solve it, I, I want to spread it out a little bit so that I can get to them and see them and, and be able to appreciate them. So we're, we're, we're 
being challenged right now to figure out how we can share all of this with our Blizzard community. Um, but when then you step back and look at eSport in general, um, how do we do this with so many electronic games coming online all the time and, and make it something that doesn't, you know, th that, that is something that can sustain itself and, and have everybody helping each other out? It's not a one-off thing, right? Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a cash grab, some people think. Mm -hmm. Honestly, to, to, to create an event, to create something for the game, to sell the game because of the event, and then nothing happens the next year. There is no sustainability in that market right, right. whatsoever. Right. Uh, you have the challenge of having multiple titles mm -hmm. for eSports. Mo, you have one title currently <laughs> that you get to focus on. How has 2014 been a great benchmark for Wargaming leading into 2015 in the future? I think the biggest thing for us was to realize the potential, really the potential of eSports for Wargaming and other companies, I think, when we look, step back and look at the ecosystem we needed to create, because, okay, we had the Super League, big investment from our side, big sponsors, big names, but then looking at the company, where is the ROI? Where is the return for us as a company? What are the benefits for it? What do we need to be sustainable? Like, the next year I can go to my boss and say, hey, I would like to have some budget, maybe, please. So there must be a reason for it. So we looked, okay, we have to create an ecosystem, like a, a road for the teams, for the players, for us as a company. So where is everyone has his share? And then we realized, okay, the top teams, we use them really from our side, give them the, empower them, meaning allow them to create brands around them, give them legal advice, reconnect sponsors who contact us with the teams, say, hey guys, you wanna sponsor this team, you wanna reach or penetrate the CS region or Korea or European country. They are very strong teams with a very strong community, so we forward partners to these teams, so the teams get sponsors, they can sustain, live from what they're doing. And then we had to create this, I, I love to call it grassroots. It's a grassroots system, meaning this is for our big audience, our players, having fun tournaments, giving them content and content, promoting a certain content. We, as a company, are interested to promote, hey, there's a new tank coming, let's put it into this tournament, or let's say max tier five tournament, so we can really control the behavior as well of the players with the content they want. The player said, here, I have only max tier four tanks and I will never go higher. Then okay, we have to create, because there's a big audience out there who is willing to play these tiers. We have to create this ecosystem which allows them to funnel in. And then the next step would be the semi-pros, these are the teams who were more playing together, more casual, or even professionally. We had some who really made the next step. They are then acquired or hired by top teams so in 2014, we realized, hey, it's, a, it's a own world for itself, which has a very strong benefit for the company, for the community, and uh, I, I would say for the industry, because esports is just the beginning in my eyes. It's something way bigger. 2014 was a very strong indicator globally for all of us to say, hey, that we have events where we have like millions of people following it, watching it, people changing spendings, interaction, commitment to a company based on events and teams, this was the biggest eye-opener for us to understand here. It helps if you allow the community to drive, because they will do, no matter what, it will happen. But if you allow them to drive and be a part and helping to the right direction, with okay, this is where we should go, the benefits outweigh anything I've seen before. Yeah, to have you know, the developers step in to help lead the community into the right area and uh, create you know, the game itself and then after the game is established and the rule sets are there, people can build leagues off of it. But developing a game, developing an eSports league and developing a broadcasted show for that league are three entirely separate things. And so how do you find the necessary people to make these things come to pass, to actually create an eSports version of the game, you could say. Not just to play online at home, but to watch it in a live stream out of a studio with professionals broadcasting, with graphics, with stats. How do you make those pieces come together? In the end, it comes all down for us to people. Really, the guys have the pleasure to work with a very passionate team, the esports team on a global scale, who are hardcore crazy nerds. And I have to say, because we all are, <laughs> it's something good, don't get me wrong, it's because we have a discussion with a partner and said, hey, they want to, this team to travel to X, Y, Z for this money. And suddenly a person stands up in front of a partner and said, no, I don't do this with my team. 
and he's working with employee and so on. But they have this connection. It's, no, it's my team. It's our thing. We work so hard together since to build all this. Then you know you have the right people. Then you say, we could see what's happening within the last year because of the guys we have. So for Blizzard, I, we get to cheat a little bit. We, I mean, the community has educated us, right? And and what is the approach? What do they want? We go to the community a lot. You're a great example of it. I mean, ESL. I, our partners are building the knowledge. Um, I I don't think we have. We we go outside to to get that expertise. And um, certainly we have a lot of, you know, ground to gain. I think within the industry. And to, when you look at ESPN, you look at NFL, you look at some of the major. Um, you know, sports that, that are out there, we can, we still have room to grow, but the, there is an expertise that's already, it started uh, a long time ago, it continues to level up all the time, and we go to that, that community um, to help put on the shows, figure out what the graphics are, what, what are the right ways to um, share the story. Um, still, obviously, room for growth there, but I, but I think um, largely the, the community has gone and been feisty and, and figured it out. And a lot of people want to tell that human story. That's the biggest thing about sports that we all enjoy, even if we're not football fans or soccer fans or baseball fans. We can understand those guys want to win and those guys want to win, and there's going to be drama behind it. And to have experts relay that drama to say, this is why this matters. This is what's at stake for this person, for this prize pool. This is what they're battling at home. That creates content. That creates entertainment that everybody can attribute a little bit of themselves to because we all enjoy that human story that we currently have. But now, when you see how people are consuming media today with more individualistic type shows and broadcasts on mobile platforms and computer platforms, does the shift occurring now focus more on the individual, or do we still have families getting together and watching esports events like they would watch the Super Bowl or like they would watch the World Cup? Are families still getting together and, and watching Twitch shows? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do believe that that's happening. I mean, I think. I think moving into the living room is still is still something that's developing, right? The thing is, esports is really only it's you know a couple of decades old technically, but in terms of this this current generation of esports growing as big as it has, really only started about five years ago. So I think that generational that sort of legacy feeling, that legacy you know cultural experience of watching with family and friends is still is still very much growing. That said, you've got bar crafts, you've got stadium events, you've got people getting together at, at you know at houses on weekends to watch together because it is an inherently social experience. Um, I think that 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 will continue to extend. I think you'll see you know you'll start seeing esports events happening in theaters around the world and and, and more bars and more venues because that's what people want. People want to get together and watch and celebrate together and, and really enjoy that social experience. Um, I think you get a decent amount of that online. Of course, not the physical side of it, but you know, the way the, one of the reasons why Twitch really ticks is is not only because of the live experience. People love watching live content. They want to be there as, as it's happening. They want to cheer and chat as crazy as it can be. Is really that mechanism for people to still interact with each other, interact with the content creators or the players. Um, so you still have that, but there's nothing like there's really nothing like sitting together and, and, and watching. Well, well, I wanted to. We talked about this I think earlier. Um, BlizzCon is such a special place to go see the phenomenon happen, even if it's not necessarily families getting together and turning on Twitch or turning on the TV to do it. Um, what you see is how effective the passion of esports is on people. So BlizzCon is largely formed as a World of Warcraft-based event. And, it, and of course, we've brought more games online, and, it, and it's bigger than that now. But Based on popul population and based on how many people play StarCraft II versus how many people go to BlizzCon that play World of Warcraft and watch people that are World of Warcraft fans, a great, my parents is, is an example of this, wandering through and they land in the spot, thousands of people gathered watching these two people play. It's super exciting. Everybody's uh, you know, screaming and yelling. And they, I don't know what I watched. This is my par parents. I don't know what I just saw, but it was so exciting. It's yeah. so exciting. So it's um, infectious. That yeah, it's, energy is infectious. And and that's the. I, I feel like that's a, a place we still um, can get to uh, in the living room. That you're switching around channels. There's some work we have to do, but you're switching around channels. The and it's my parents, or, yeah. and they they hit the the stream channel, and then they see this thing and they get excited and pulled in. Um, Right now, I feel like we're generally speaking to our existing communities, but with a little bit more work here, a little bit more uh, outlining those stories, getting some of the elite speak of, of uh, esports away because it is so community created, 
um, that we can reach to that other audience and and it, it, it's just all up. Or get a beginner's guide to esports as well. And just here's what this right? lingo means yeah. for this game and understand. Well, you look back again. I, I hearken back to what the world was like 95 years ago with sports. Team owners for baseball were very concerned about baseball games being broadcasted over the radio because they thought nobody's going to come watch the games in our stadium. They're going to sit at home and listen to the games. We all know that's not true. It's not the same thing of listening at home on the radio than actually going to the game. But a couple stats from ESL. We actually held the first esports event in a World Cup stadium in Europe. We had 12,500 people a day in attendance at that event with 4 million unique on viewers. So you can still have the stadium event, the social event where everybody gets together and still have an excellent broadcast that people will tune into. It's the same principle we've seen in traditional sports over the last 90 years. So I don't think there's much concern there. But as we, we move along here, gentlemen, we have to look at what are the challenges for 2015 and what's the future. So let's start with you, Kevin. What are some challenges that esports still has right now? Yeah, I mean, for, from our perspective, um, esports is continuing to grow very globally. Um, and we, in terms of what Twitch has to do, we gotta basically build out and make sure people get access to it, right? That means additional servers around the world, that means better localization of content. I think that, that also dovetails into the content creators and, and the leagues. How do you bring you know, better commentary? How do you help people that are just sort of flyby esports, you know, potential fans understand those games better? And that's going to be an educational process. It's also going to require a lot of translation work, obviously. Um, and how can we work to, to help um, expedite that, make that more accessible, bring more accessible, uh, accessibility to esports around the world? Um, beyond that, you know, it's, it's, it's revenue model, just as we, got, you know, we were talking about you know, the sustainability of esports. What is really going to drive that growth? I mean, for game companies, you know, there should be a, you know, ho hopefully there's a tangible benefit of as esports continues to grow, it drives more people into the game, it drives longevity of the game, so you see that direct impact. But for leagues, you know, what's really going to drive the growth for them? What's going to make continuing to bring larger events around the world um, uh, to be a good business model for those companies? Uh, and time will tell, and I think we, you know, we'd, like, we'd love to help with that, whether it's bringing sponsors to events and teams um, or otherwise, or opening up additional revenue streams. That's something we, we really need to actively explore and continue to do so. Um, and then it's you know, helping communicate back to game companies um, and, and, the, and the streamers what's, what's the, what's, what are the slightly intangible benefits. What, what can you really gain from supporting an esports ecosystem, whether you're very active in it, um, like a Riot or uh, or gaming or a blizzard, um, or whether you're sort of more hands-off and just sort of let that ecosystem thrive. Can you still support that ecosystem directly as a game company? Um, so those are the types of things we'll be exploring this year. Um, but a lot of it's just going to be, you know, continuing to bring um, bring access to Twitch and esports to as many people around the world as we can. And you're continuing to do so. My parents know about Twitch now, so <laughs> good job so far, Kevin and Twitch. Chris, for Blizzard, what are some of the challenges? Yeah, for the, the biggest challenge I think for us in 2015 is is the number of games that we have that we're dealing with all simultaneously. They each have a different solution. I mean, there's some similarities in there. It's all, again, community building, but um, the approach to Hearthstone, for example, is uh, much more grassroots, much more come up through uh, accessibility through fireside gatherings, and um, that's very different than w running the WCS League for StarCraft II which is different than forming what we want for heroes on top of uh, World of Warcraft arena play. And so it's, it's our biggest challenge personally is managing all of that. We're growing significantly to deal with that on the esports side. Um, so that's specific internal challenges. Um, externally, I'd like to see us start getting out there and talking about this, the infrastructure itself. What are we doing that makes sure that Blizzard uh, the, the effort we put into this, the support of the community, does end up leveling this up um, in, in a way that we saw happen with professional sports. Um, we talked a little bit about how, if, you, if you're involved in baseball, for example, there are so many different ways that you can express that being a high school coach, uh, you know, going, uh, working at a stadium, working at a place that sells baseball bats. Trainers, uh, commentators, trainer, Exactly, writers. it goes on, and, and it's massive industry, right? Um, because of the challenges with where we are at, how, how are we doing it if a game's life cycle is, say, 10 years, um, shorter often? Um, what are we doing to make sure that this, this our, our ads to this are ultimately leveling up the entirety of the ecosystem? So first, we'll be looking inward at our own challenges, then we'll be moving out and starting to talk about that with 
folks like you. Great. Mo? Uh, 2015 for us for sure will be uh, challenging as we will implement a very complete new system uh, in our esports world, meaning focusing, creating this ecosystem which we talked about, helping those superstars teams to get sponsorship, to have like a sustainable income, uh, but more important is to build the infrastructure for this grassroots audience. We have the biggest one, hundreds of thousands of players who we can drag into our late game content if you want to, and to build a base for esports overall. The challenge there is, I would say, our own mindset. And this is my, my, my vision, my, my, my head is, um, we have a tendency to label things. that we do with esports right now as well. We call it esports, it must be highly competitive. It's like sports, completely the same. I think it's just the beginning. It's just the surface we're scratching. We don't really understand it yet. The community drives it. And there's a big challenge or danger that we maybe um, try to control it. Suffocating Meaning, it, maybe yes, suffocating the growth. This is esports, has to be like this. These are the criteria as developers, as publishers, as com whoever is included, just involved, tries to push it down. But I strongly believe it will happen anyway. It will grow. It will uh, go through evolution steps, 100%. The question is, are we ready to be a part of it, to drive it forward, or uh, do we have a more negative impact because of personal or agendas we have in mindset? So this is a big challenge on the human base, on a professional company, monetization base. It will happen. The question is, are we able to be a part of it in a good way? Uh, wrapping up, the question I want to ask, in particular dealing with new media right now, it's still considered the Wild West compared to established mediums of radio and television and film with unions and standards and practices. But for each of you, are there certain standards and practices that your company upholds when broadcasting or when showing these esports events? Starting with you, Kevin. I mean, for us, you know, we, we like to you know, help promote a lot of the events that are running on the site. Um, there's so many events these days. There's a ton of overlap. Like, just, uh, just this coming weekend, I think we've got seven or so esports events, mostly in different games. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the way we, we, we try to think and work with all these event creators and, 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 the, and the grassroots community con uh, content creators is kind of help them organize a little bit, facilitate that a little bit, um, because we'd like to see, you know, all ships rise. I mean, it's, it's still so early in esports. Um, I think, as most say, we're really just barely even scratching the surface, uh, and a lot of it's so community-driven. It's, it's sort of the desire of those individual game communities to, to, to want those esports to grow. Um, that for us, it's more just you know, sitting back and, and trying to support it as much as we can in any way that we can. Um, but as a distributor, you know, we like to see more content, but we also see that there's a glut of content at certain times in a specific game. Um, and how does that organize? We don't, you know, we don't really get involved in that, uh, at that level, but if we can, we'd love to help, help help that scene you know, sort of self-organize and figure out ways to help better storytelling, um, create better conditions for all those involved. And for Blizzard, which has such a high personal standard when it comes to your video games as they're released, do you try to hold to those same standards when it comes to the broadcast? Because they are representing Blizzard products. Yeah, we, we get involved when the, um, the prize pools get above a certain level. Right now, $10,000. We try our best to um, be at those events do our best to help out whoever the partner is that we're working with on that and, and shoot for a, a quality level um, that, that meets the expectations of the viewers and, and, and us. Um, we, we're, it's organic, right? We continue to flex and change that and work with partners. And oftentimes, it's the partners that are educating us on, actually, you should be doing this and put up a graphic in this way. Um, but we've also built up, we have a great team, passionate team of esports folks that have been doing this now for many years, going back to original StarCraft and learning too. So them being at these events help um, some level of standards, but there's a whole nother class of, of esport events happening that don't, aren't under WCS points in StarCraft, for example. Um, Hearthstone, I think, had a, a million dollars in prize pool that was not part of the Hearthstone, uh, our Hearthstone system that ended at, at BlizzCon this year. That was just community-driven uh, events. So we're not at all of those, and we kind of let the community, I mean, the community does what they do, and we're, we're excited they're doing it. it. And so far, it's gone really well with that. There isn't um, terrible things happening out there. Um, but people tune in where they're excited. So we, uh, you know, it's, it's democracy in action right there. Capital, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but for Wargaming, that Momentum continues to grow as we'll get closer and closer to the Global Grand Finals in, in Warsaw, Poland. 
And the finals were held there last year. And on the biggest government building in the entire city, this giant logo of World of Tanks was put up there, which to me was just another bastion, another benchmark when it came to esports and the impact that gaming has had on the world and within our culture. But does wargaming have a certain standard they always want to <laughs> stick to? Yeah, we always try a triple A, the best quality, but we, we make mistakes and they're healthy, they're good, we should make mistakes, we learn. We looked around, very important is sharing and caring. A good example is I've been at so many Blizzard or even Riot events like the Stable Center, the big uh, events where the guys inviting us, showing us the backstage. This is how we do it, this is our server area, these are the rules, our UIs. So it's, there's a beauty I think right now with the esports in the industry, we share, we're not afraid. We talk uh, just now for the grand final, good example was Riot about the dates. Here, these are our dates, what are your events planned? Let's adjust so we have like the best impact for both companies. We switch together to make sure that we have like a very good visibility. We do present us in the best light for all of us. So this is a good thing for the companies that they're very open, they're sharing. They gave us ideas for our UI. They say, hey, if you guys are watching, look at this area, maybe you want to change that. It's like, oh, very good point, very good point. And then I said, what about balance? You know, right now, I think it's a big open pool, luckily, where people are not afraid to share and give best advices because it helps everyone. So this is something, our own standards are very high, but if we look around, we can see, okay, there's much to learn. We should not be afraid of that. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Closing remarks. Kevin, Lynn from Twitch, we'll start with you. Sure. No, I mean, eSports has been absolutely instrumental to, to our business um, just from the start um, and the continued growth. Uh, keep an eye on it. It's going to be big. Um, I, I predict in five years it's going to be a top three sport in aggregate around the world. Uh, it's going to take a lot, of, you know, uh, a lot of attention from game companies, from, from sponsors to support it. Um, so you know, keep, keep pushing it forward. Um, don't give up. Uh, if you're interested in an eSport, you know, there's plenty of people you can talk to that have a lot of experience. Um, so if you're a game developer out there that's interested, tap into that knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge out there. There's experiences that are still, still coming and people are still learning. Um, but it's, uh, it's a great space. Um, it's where an entire generation of people are, are, are headed that it is, is going to be their form of entertainment. It's going to be handed down from generation to generation. Um, and, the, and the beauty of it is it's fun, it's exciting, um, and it's really only just beginning. Chris Sigety from Blizzard. Yeah, so uh, outlining the challenges we have with all of the games that we're dealing with right now, um, be beyond that, I think to this audience that we, we are interested in talking about what does it mean to partner in this, even across games, across companies, what are those things we should be doing that we can uh, codify and, and put together and, and sort of uh, do it, uh, do it as, as teams uh, to, to make this happen um, versus all doing it sort of individually. And it, it's happening, it's there, but we'd love to start having those conversations this year um, about how, it, how we all continue to level this up together. Mohamed Fadel from Wargaming. I would say two things. First of all, uh, colleagues here, if you plan to launch an eSports game, uh, because I was asked before, what do we have to do? What do we need? I would always recommend focus on creating the game you really want to believe in. In the first place, no matter what, make the game. Don't say, okay, I need this, 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 because you, you mutate what you're doing. In the end, the community will take it, and they will turn it into an eSports, if you want it or not. And this is from my own experience. So I would say we're at the beginning of something very, very big, and very passionate, very lucky that we could be a part of that. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. My closing remarks is 95 years ago, everybody knew that radio was a top media format to get your sports information. 50 years ago, everybody knew that television was a media format. And in 2005, the internet started to change. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, with eSports, what the world would be like tomorrow. Thank you much for your time, and enjoy the rest of DICE.